So um, I'm Chamit, and uh, I'm currently overseeing uh, overall cloud operations at WSO2, including WSO2 public cloud operations and managed cloud operations. So uh, before I start my uh, presentation, uh, can you like raise your hands like if you are like into operations, if you're doing like uh, doing operations work as part of your job, like, okay, we got a few, nice. And uh, do you know how to spot an ops guy? So they are the ones who are in jeans and with uh, loose uh, or open shoelaces. Okay, so uh, I will be talking about uh, DevOps and uh, automation and orchestration aspects of DevOps. And then uh, I will briefly describe if you, are, if you are building an automation and an orchestration uh, platform or framework in your organization, uh, what are the things that you have to consider and uh, how that process happens at a high level. And then uh, we will discuss uh, uh, CI CD process and how it is implemented. And then uh, I will walk you through some examples and some tools that you can use, use to uh, build your auto, uh, orchestration and automation platform. And then uh, at last, I will describe how we or how WSO2 can help you to build your own, uh, build your own uh, uh, infrastructure uh, for automation and orchestration. And, uh, how we can provide you that as a service. Okay, so DevOps. I'm sure like almost all of you are like quite familiar with this. It's a gig between ops folks and dev folks. So that's the area where they come together and dance. And uh, automation is again very simple. You must be doing like lots of manual repetitive tasks uh, on daily basis or on weekly basis or regularly. So you just pick up those tasks, you identify those tasks, repetitive things you do, and uh, then you simply script it, you automate it. You write a script or a program that has all the steps of all the uh, repetitive tasks you do, you put it into one script and you just run it. It's simple as that, you have automated something. And the orchestration. Orchestration is, uh, again, like part of automation. Without automation, you cannot have orchestration. So you might be having like several uh, pieces, several uh, operate components that you, uh, that you have already automated in your organization. You might have automated uh, uh, the deployment part, or the change management part, or the monitoring part, or backups and disaster recovery parts. So orchestration means you take all those uh, things you have automated and do the coordination and uh, collect statistics and build, uh, and build dashboards and uh, uh, using the matrix around things you have automated. And uh, then that will enable you to take decisions based on the stats and, uh, and, uh, and, and the behavior of uh, all, each, uh, all individual components that you have automated. So we will see how that can be done uh, at, at the later stage. So uh, when you're building an, automator, or an automation or an orchestration framework, uh, these are the things as I see are important to consider. So first thing is the visibility. Visibility is as a person, as an operations person, or as a, as a manager, uh, you need to be able to see the state or the, sta or, or the behavior or like how successful uh, the work you have done, things like that. So there should be dashboards and, uh, and uh, all the tools you have used to automate should publish some sort of data that you can collect and analyze and present you in a useful manner. So then that, 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 like, that improves visibility across the platform rather than like you have to go to each individual component that you have automated and see how it is doing, and uh, whether the process has slowed down for some reason, how the response time is, whether is it like a response time has gone up, or is it like just stables at one level, things like that. So 
every piece you automate, like, like I said earlier, there are certain pieces like you can individually automate, and those things can, should be able to publish some sort of statistics. So you have to consider that when you're automating things. When you're writing your automation scripts, you should be able, you, like you do it, you should do it in a way where it publishes some numbers or some statistics or matrices or anything that you can collect and analyze and present in a meaningful manner. And that, so that is something you have to think of when you're uh, developing your uh, automation platform. And the second one is uh, the automation and orchestration itself, like how fast you can deliver changes. So this basically comes, since I'm talking this under uh, the umbrella of DevOps, uh, delivering changes starts from the laptop that the code is being written. So the moment someone checks in the code, it goes through a cycle, and you need to be able to see like where, 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 where are the points that it took time most, for example, where, where, in, which, in which areas that manual, like uh, human intervention is necessary. Or like if you can automate those things, like you can obviously make the whole workflow smoother and faster. So the workflow starts from, the, from a workstation and ends from the production environment or your production deployment. So throughout that whole, whole flow, you need to be able to see, like, uh, again, through the statistics and, uh, and, and the data you gathered, it should be able to, your, your platform or your framework should be able to present you uh, uh, how well it is working and whether it is functioning as the way you desired. The other one is the governance. Governance is when you're building an automation or an orchestration platform, it should be able to enforce certain standards, best practices. So that is something, again, you have to keep in mind. So every time, like for example, if you, if you are doing a deployment uh, in your data center, you must, you must be like already having some internal standards that are enforced upon you like through uh, some compliances uh, uh, you have uh, set, uh, you have like implemented internally or some internally standards that you all together came up with in within your organization so you have to there should be a way to enforce those standards so that the framework itself makes sure that nothing we we we, we don't leave behind anything and every time we move forward we go along with those standards and best practices and everything so people don't have to like keep things in mind and go and check every time something happens, whether uh, whether the result when the result comes, no one need to no one needs to go and see like uh, whether this is comply with our internal standards. How does the process happens uh, in previous stages? When you deploy it into into the production environment, it, whether it uh, follows the best practices, whether it goes through the um, goes through the checkpoints. Uh, you have set up. So those kind of things should be able to include it into the framework and uh, enforce through, through it. And the fle flexibility. Flexibility means every tool you write internally, every piece of code you write internally should be used, should be able to use with some other tools. That, that's how usually uh, the, the Unix tool set, the Unix commands work. So ev any commands, any utilities output can be taken as an input to another tool. So that's why like, most of the time, uh, they do not present, uh, say for example, if you just run the DF command, it will not give you the numbers in a human-friendly way. It will give, give all the numbers in bytes. Why? Because you can always like, uh, use that output and feed into another program and do some other work. So you should follow some similar practice with your tools as well. So, uh, so uh, if I tell you an example, if your tool can output things in a standard way, like if, uh, let's assume like, uh, uh, if your tool can uh, present its output in a, in, a form, in a form of a JSON, for example, and you can write your, uh, you can, when you're writing new tools, you can always write it like read, if there's, a, if there's another input present in JSON format, you take it in and process it and do some other work and then again put another it put its output as an as JSON format, so then you can like integrate your tools uh, in a way 
so that they work together and uh, and uh, that eventually enables like uh, improves the reusability of components and uh, and uh, uh, make the efficiency of whole automation and orchestration framework and uh, the other aspect is extensibility except ex extensibility is something uh, you like Seneca mentioned in his previous session, every project has a gradual it go it, it, it has a gradual cycle of uh, improving. So it goes through a cycle. Projects don't like come and uh, they don't like simply start working uh, in the like a uh, ideal way uh, at any time. You have to like uh, first start with something and then keep improving uh, the project. So a similar concept uh, applies. Uh, when you're building uh, these sort of platforms. And this is how the CI-CD uh, workflow works. I just put it there just to, uh, just, uh, to complete the story. I'm sure like uh, you all are familiar with how continuous integration and continuous delivery works. If any of you are not familiar with it. So who have implemented CI, a proper CI-CD cycle in their organizations? Okay, you got a few. Okay, we got a few. Oh, wonderful. So uh, uh, the main difference between the delivery and the deployment part is uh, that's the key thing I wanted to highlight. Uh, the parts in blue, those are like manual operations. Like the automated part stops soon after you, uh, soon after the integration point. After that, the change management and the deployment thing, they have like someone has to. Um, go in and like take that decision manually and do that. That is what happens when uh, you have continuous delivery. But if you have continuous deployment, everything from the uh, code check-in to deployed uh, all the way up to the production deployment, everything is automated when you have continuous deployment set up. So uh, this is an example of uh, how orchestration and how coordination can be worked with multiple technologies. So uh, you can see like there are some uh, tools that you can use. So uh, let's start with users. So the, uh, the user management component has to be there, obviously, because all of, all of these uh, tools and uh, products uh, are user-driven programs. So uh, there should be some user management component with necessary uh, access control and uh, authentication and authorization uh, schemes. And then you have the, uh, then you are using uh, another set of tools to write the code. And once you write the code, you deploy the code to a repository. It could be an SVN repository or a, or a Git repository or whatever. And then soon the code is checked in to the repository. A hook gets triggered and inform the build tools, such as Jenkins or Bamboo or whatever the build tool that, that you have in place to run the build. So that build tool will take the uh, code from the repository and run the build. If the build is successful, it will get pushed to, uh, to your infrastructure. And infrastructure, again, can be either a, 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 a bare metal device or a virtual machine or a container or whatever. And once you have that, then you run tests. You run automated tests, you run integration tests, you run UAT, UAT tests, and all sorts of tests you can. And again, like if you have continuous deployment in place, since everything is automated, like I mentioned here, uh, that becomes a policy-driven process then. Uh, say, for example, if your integration, like once you run your integration test, if the uh, success rate of, uh, of the test is above 95%, let's take that for example, then only you uh, deploy that into the, then only you promote that into the next environment. Or uh, if you run some other set of tests, uh, then uh, this, uh, the success rate of those tests are beyond a certain, certain limit. You advance uh, the components or your artifacts into the next environment. So then policies comes into the picture. And then that again goes to the governance cycle and uh, and, and, and then you have to like manage it in a way so that it applies across uh, the organization. And then after that, you have the issue tracking tools. Once you run the test, if the test, test suit finds issues, it creates tickets automatically 
uh, in the issue tracking system. And then users present and users pick issues and fix those. They change the code, they commit the changes back to the repository, and the bill gets triggered. So it goes on, goes and on, on as a cycle. So these are some of the tools you can use uh, to enable DevOps in your organization. I have mentioned some tools that you can automate infrastructure management work, and some tools that will help you to uh, uh, help you with change management, and uh, some tools that will help you with orchestration. So uh, the first line, the Puppet Chef, Ansible, CF Engine, those kind of tools are good for change management. Those tools are built for that purpose. And M Collective is an orchestration tool. M Collective is something that uh, using a single console, you can orchestrate uh, hundreds of servers. Uh, so, and that enables you to work with servers without remembering any IP addresses or host names. It uses like different characteristics of servers and keeps it in a store. And you can, uh, you can search for search using those characteristics and identify the servers or the group of servers in your data center. For example, you can say uh, with M Collective, like give me the list of servers where I have Red Hat uh, this particular version installed. And it will give you the list of servers. And then you can, similarly you can say, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have like servers distributed geographically, uh, take the servers uh, that are in, uh, let's say, Ireland data center and apply this patch to that. Likewise, you can do like lots of uh, fabulous things with M Collective. And CloudFormation and uh, OpsWork are infrastructure management tools that you can completely automate your infrastructure deployment. And uh, in uh, CloudFormation is an AWS tool that let, uh, helps you with uh, automating AWS infrastructure. And uh, OpsWork is something uh, that works with OpenStack and uh, similar uh, salt is another uh, uh, another tool that you can use with uh, uh, this sort of automation work. So uh, WSO2 is heavily using Puppet. Uh, there's no main reason why we choose Puppet. It it was a simply it was simple reason because we felt comfortable with Puppet, and uh, the learning curve was uh, it was not that steep with Puppet. So that's the main reason we picked Puppet. But uh, after some time, uh, like we are using Puppet for several years now, and uh, now we are at a stage where we are writing more Ruby code inside Puppet than Puppet DSL. So uh, in the modules that we write, uh, if you take a Chef or an Ansible module uh, and the Puppet modules, like, uh, you can find like, lots of similarities between those. So uh, in this repository, we, uh, GitHub uh, repository, we have hosted all the Puppet modules we have written. And uh, there are Puppet modules for all WSO2 products. You can uh, download those, and uh, you can use them uh, to build your own uh, automation and orchestration infrastructure. And uh, finally, uh, uh, like I said, WSO2 can always help you with uh, automating your infrastructure, automating your deployment, enable orchestration, and uh, Build your own, build your own uh, orchestration and automation framework. So we provide that as a managed service. So um, uh, what is meant by managed service is uh, WSO2 run the deployment. WSO2 take care of the deployment, uh, monitor it. We apply patch. We do the upgrades. We back up. Uh, we implement disaster recovery and everything. We manage this whole story for you. And currently we are. Uh, Sub, like we do that operation only on top of AWS, because uh, that's like uh, uh, so the envi environment and the infrastructure should be something uh, that is uh, it, 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 it is treated as a common ground for you and us, and both of us should be able to comfortably use that infrastructure. So this is the one we felt like most comfortable with, and uh, most of our clients are quite comfortable with. So uh, we thought of like going ahead with AWS for now. And uh, maybe uh, in the future, we will uh, move into other platforms and uh, support managed service uh, on those platforms as well. And it's a fully managed service. And uh, we guarantee a 4.9 uh, availability for that. And uh, you can read more about uh, the WSO2 managed service uh, from these two URLs. And 
the documentation URL explains uh, the different use cases and how we address certain cases. Like if you want to use uh, AWS as, your, as an extension of your own data center, how we can provide those, like uh, what are the things we can easily do to enable that, that sort of things. For example, like set up a direct connect link or set up a VPN connection. And, uh, and uh, what are the things that we expect from you as clients uh, when we are, uh, when we are uh, doing, providing these managed cloud services, things like that. All right, thank you.